All right, cosmology again. Good morning. Um, when I hear the other lectures, I keep thinking that how nice it is, how simple cosmology in fact is. Uh, all right, so what happened so far? On Monday, we spoke about the roots of cosmology in general relativity and how we arrive at a metric and at an equation for the dynamics of this metric. Tuesday, we looked into the geometrical properties of the of the standard model. Right? We studied distance measures, the concept of horizons. We looked at the age of the universe and saw that fortunately everything within the universe is younger than the universe seems to be. Um, we also spoke about why it does make sense to speak about the age of the universe in the first place, right? because we saw that at least within the Friedman models, the universe does have uh, or must have had a big <coughs> bang, right, which is not guaranteed from the from the beginning. All right, and then we talked about the thermal evolution of, of particle species in the universe and saw that the assumption that these particle species are in thermal equilibrium is particularly good in the beginning of the universe, even though the universe is then expanding very rapidly. And we saw that later, as particles are being diluted by the cosmic expansion, um, particles freeze out of thermal equilibrium. Now we are studying, or we are, we are going to continue studying uh, two <coughs> processes where recombination reactions uh, are taking place. The first one is the recombination of protons with electrons to form hydrogen atoms, and then we will apply the exact same principles to um, the formation of the, of the first and lightest nuclei. So that was the point where we stopped at, or this, this slide here, uh, was the slide where we stopped on, on Tuesday. And I told you how we arrived at this equation, right? it's this uh, so-called Saha equation that you see in the, um, on the top of the slide. So the origin of that equation was that we just uh, set up the free energy for the reaction proton plus electron turns into hydrogen or back. And by minimizing the free energy, we arrived at this equation here. And the key point was that even though there is a Boltzmann factor relating the ionization energy of hydrogen to the, to the thermal energy, right, there's, uh, this, this is largely <coughs> compensated by this factor of 1 over eta here. Right, recall that eta was the number of baryons per photon in the universe, which is a very small number. So 1 over eta is a very large number. It's about a billion. So this means that this kind of recombination reaction is grossly delayed until the temperature um, falls much below the reionization energy of hydrogen. In fact, recombination takes place when the universe has cooled to about 3000 kelvins. That's a very important number for cosmology, as you will see. Um, and as you see from the slide, it's also one that we know quite precisely. All right. In the left plot here, you see the ionization fraction. And this plot is essentially meant to show you how quickly recombination proceeds once it sets in. And so here is, on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, you see the thermal energy running from 0.26 to 0.4 electron volts. Right. And this is the ionization fraction. So if it is 1, the medium is completely ionized. We have the plasma state. And now you see, once it starts dropping below one, recombination finishes very quickly. This, by the way, is the only reason why the Saha equation is applicable. Right? Because the Saha equation assumes that um, thermal equilibrium is being maintained while the process is running. Strictly speaking, this is not the case. Right? Because while reionization proceeds, the mean free path of the particles gets ever longer and therefore thermal equilibrium breaks down while recombination <coughs> proceeds. And nonetheless, uh, the Saha equation, which assumes thermal equilibrium throughout, is a good assumption, and the reason why this is, is because recombination is so fast. All right, um, this is an important curve, which is the result of a pole among photons. I mean if, you, if you receive cosmic microwave background photons, of which there are approximately 400 per cubic centimeters, and you ask all of them, when did you last meet an electron? That's the distribution of answers that they are going to give to you, where when is measured in redshift. 
Right, so you see there's a distribution in redshift when photons are being released um, from the cosmic plasma. And you see that this curve has a finite width. So in other words, um, the release of the photons um, in the early universe does not happen instantaneously. It takes a while. And it's important to see how long it takes. It's easy to calculate. So first of all, from the fact that the temperature has to drop to about 3,000 kelvins <coughs> before recombination sets in, we know when, so at what redshift this happens. How do we know that? We can measure the temperature of the cosmic microwave background today. Right? It's 2.726 kelvins. And we know that the temperature um, evolves like 1 over the scale factor. Right? So we know that uh, the scale factor when the recombination set in had to be approximately 10 to the minus 3. Um, we can read this off the temperature. We can calculate how old the universe must have been. Uh, it turns out to be approximately 380,000 years. All right, now, uh, if you measure the width of this almost Gaussian redshift distribution that I showed you, turns out to correspond to a delta Z of about 75, which is a fairly short time I at, at this epoch, so it tells you that the whole recombination epoch lasted for about 40,000 years. We will need this number later when we speak about the appearance of the cosmic microwave background. That's an, an, an important thing. So. Roughly speaking, it happened about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. It took about 40,000 years, and about the tenth of the age of the universe at that time. All right. Yeah, let me get to, to the rest later. All right, what we haven't addressed yet is the question whether the radiation we can actually observe is, in fact, uh, heat radiation. Right, so from standard cosmology you would conclude that the photon background that we now see in the in the universe and that was released when the universe was about 380,000 years old uh, should be heat radiation. The question is, is it really? Right, the first, uh, first measurement of this, of this uh, radiation uh, was, was taken in 1965 at a single frequency and of course, when you observe a single frequency, you can't tell whether the radiation that you see at that frequency is in fact heat radiation or not. And it took until uh, 1990, when on board of the COBE satellite, uh, an instrument called FIRAS, it was in fact possible to measure uh, this spectrum of the, uh, of the cosmic background radiation, which is still the best observed Planck spectrum, including all laboratory experiments on Earth. Right, the error bars you see are 400 sigma error bars. This is just for you to see them, and right? otherwise they, uh, they would not be visible within the, the line width. The reason, of course, why we can measure this curve so exquisitely well is because the, uh, the number density of the CMP photons is so high. Right, it's 400 per cubic centimeter. Now imagine, suppose you have a detector of a square centimeter area, and it sweeps through a sea of photons like that with the speed of light, it collects a lot of photons over time. And so the, the very high number density of the photons um, is the reason why this can be measured so, <coughs> so precisely. For that, John Martha and his group got the Nobel Prize. <coughs> All right. Now, we can apply the exact same concepts to primordial nucleosynthesis, except that the particle species that are reacting are now not proton plus electron to hydrogen, but proton pl uh, plus proton to deuterium. Right, so the exact things are going to happen, except that the, the temperature scale or the energy scale, of course, is set by the binding energy of the deuterium nucleus rather than the hydrogen atom. Apart from that, the concepts stay exactly the same. Right, so you set up the free energy uh, for the corresponding reaction equation. Uh, you insert the number of photons per baryon that we know is a constant over time. You insert the Boltzmann factor and you're done. All right. So we need to, uh, we need to go back in time um, until the typical thermal energies of the photons are on the order of a mega electron volt, right? because that corresponds to the energy levels of nuclei. Now, we know that 
the recombination of hydrogen happened when the universe had cooled down to approximately 0.3 electron volts. We know that the universe now is a factor of a thousand larger than that, so this means that the typical energy scale today is about 0.3 milli electron volts right, for the photons that we now observe in the universe. In other words, we get the scale factor where we reach mega electron volt energies just by dividing milli electron volts by mega electron volts. So we get uh, a typical scale factor of 10 to the minus 9 and before when nuclear synthesis is, is ex expected to, to, uh, to have happened. The important message from that is that this is way, way before the scale factor of matter radiation equality. So in other words, nothing in the universe happens, uh, sorry, nothing for the universe matters, uh, that is contained in the universe, matters for the expansion rate of the universe except the radiation. So whatever kind of matter, cosmological constant, curvature, or whatever you mix into your model universe, it's irrelevant, right? Because we are at a time when only radiation controls the expansion speed of the universe. And that is very important because whatever, whatever you assume about the matter content of the universe, choose it as you, weigh, uh, as, as, as you may, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter, it's not relevant. All right, so there is only one parameter that controls um, the uh, procedure of, of primordial nuclear synthesis. Um, and this is this eta parameter, right? How many photons do I have per baryon? That's the only relevant parameter. And then you can, uh, you can use a typical time scale here, right? Which comes from the approximation of the cosmological model by a purely radiation dominated universe tells you that at a temperature of about an MeV, one second had passed after the Big Bang, and it drops like the tem uh, uh, temperature to the minus two. Mm. Sorry, the time increases like uh, temperature to the minus two. In other words, what we are going to, to do now is look at the process of recombination, compare it to observations of the uh, abundances of the lightest elements in the universe and by that probe the universe at a time when it was between several seconds and about a minute old. That's very important to realize, right? The energy scale of the, of the binding uh, energies of the nuclei uh, means that with nuclear synthesis we probe the universe about a minute after the Big Bang. Very important. All right. Now here are the processes. It's also for you to memorize. Uh, the important thing to realize is that um, you have to go through deuterium fusion, right? Because um, the direct fusion of helium by uh, the fusion of, of uh, two protons and two neutrons is way too improbable. Right? It's also energetically disfavored. So you have to go through um, the fusion of two deuterium nuclei, which later fuse to um, either helium-3 or helium-4. All right, so we need to look at the binding energy of the deuterium nucleus, which is 2.2 MeV. But of course, again, by the, by the enormous overabundance of photons compared to baryons, the recombination process of the nuclei is also correspondingly delayed as the recombination of hydrogen was delayed by the, by the very high um, number of photons per baryon. So instead of at an energy scale of 2.2 MeV, this process or the nucleosynthesis process is delayed until uh, temperature drops to about 78 kilo electron volts. Right? Only then uh, deuterium can be effectively formed. Okay. Good. So we have to wait until then. If you insert this in the, in, into the, the, the preceding formula, so that's about uh, 0.08 mega electron volts, that gives you a time scale of about uh, a minute right, when deuterium fusion sets in. Okay, neutrons and protons are completely in thermal equilibrium until the temperature drops below the mass difference between uh, the neutron and the proton, uh, and this happens at about two seconds after the Big Bang. So between about two seconds 
and two minutes after the Big Bang. Neutrons and protons are separate. So their abundance is no longer controlled by the Boltzmann factor, as it is while they are in thermal equilibrium. But by the decay of the, of, of the neutrons, which then sets in, and the neutrons decay with about a quarter of an hour uh, lifetime, the free neutrons. So in other words, neutrons and protons are being kept in thermal equilibrium by the isospin symmetry right, until the universe is about two seconds old, and then the neutrons start decaying. So the abundance of neutrons keeps dropping until finally the fusion of deuterium can set in. Uh, and when this happens, the neutrons that remain, if they fuse completely to, hydro uh, to, to helium with the remaining hydrogen, um, amounts to an effective final helium abundance of about po uh, 0.28. That's a rough estimate, right? But nonetheless, we, we, we assume, or we, we, can, we can easily calculate in, in that way, right? With the, uh, first of all, starting with the, with the thermal equilibrium, then continuing with the neutron decay, that um, as many neutrons are left in the, in the cosmic material, as you need to convert about a quarter of the cosmic plasma by mass to helium, okay? So for every 1,000 grams of, of cosmic plasma, you get about 250 grams of helium within a minute. Okay, So the universe converts uh, a quarter of the, of the available hydrogen to helium within about a minute. All right. Um, once you have deuterium, you can produce other elements. Right? These are tritium, helium-3, helium-4, lithium-7, beryllium-8, but beryllium-8 decays very quickly. And since this is so, the abundance of beryllium-8 will always be small, so that you can't directly fuse beryllium-8 plus helium-4 to carbon-12. Right? So essentially, at the fusion of, of lithium-7, the whole process of primordial nuclear synthesis stops. And it's not possible to create efficient numbers of, of uh, carbon um, in this, this primordial uh, nucleus synthesis step. Okay. All right. So then you can, you can calculate from the nuclear cross sections how much deuterium, helium 3, lithium 7, helium 4, and so on you expect to have formed within the approximately one minute that the universe had to do this. Right? Before, approximately two minutes after the Big Bang, it was just too hot. Right? The newly formed deuterium nuclei would immediately be destroyed. About a minute later, it was already too cold. Okay. So, what you see here are the, um, are the abundances for Helium-4 on top, deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7, all relative to hydrogen, expected from the theory of nucleosynthesis. Right? And they are all being plotted um, as functions of the only relevant parameter, which is the abundance of, um, of baryons compared to photons. And you see, the more baryons you have, the, the less deuterium you expect. And this comes from the fact that the more barons you have, the more additional fusion from beginning from deuterium you can achieve. Right? So this means that the more barons you have available, the more of effectively the intermediate uh, deuterium that you form is being burned away. And the less barons you have, um, the, the more of the deuterium remains un, uh, unprocessed. Okay? So at the same time, the hydrogen, sorry, the, the, the helium abundance would, would grow, right? the deuterium abundance would fall, and so on. So by comparison uh, of the measured uh, abundances of the light elements with hydrogen and with each other, you can conclude um, 
how many baryons you have per photon. But the observations of the cosmic microwave background tell you how many photons you have, so this allows you to measure the, uh, the baryon abundance in the universe. Okay. The measurement is extremely difficult. Right? One of the reasons is that, of course, if you want to identify deuterium in comparison to hydrogen, you have to do this by absorption lines. And here you see one example where you see the, the dominant absorption by hydrogen and the little additional dip that you get from the deuterium. And you have to measure <coughs> spectral lines like this um, in very, very high redshift objects, right? so that the pollution of the original cosmic material by the, the subsequent generations of stars is still controllably <coughs> low. Right? So in very high redshift quasars, for example, um, you have to measure tiny deviations of the line profile from what you expect for pure hydrogen. So the measurement is very difficult. Nonetheless, nonetheless it allows you to conclude that baryons only form a small contribution to the matter budget of the universe. This is the very important message from the primordial nucleus of synthesis. And it tells you that um, you may have approximately 4% 4% of the critical density in baryons, no more than that. And if you had more than that, then you would expe I expect e essentially no deuterium anymore and much more, uh, much more helium. Right? So remember, H squared is about a half. Right? So this is why I'm saying uh, this allows approximately 4% of the critical density in baryons. So we know that the ordina ordinary matter that we know of can amount to approximately 4% of the critical density. No more than that. Okay. All right. This is what I wanted to say for now about the thermal history of the universe. Uh, I will come back to that when we speak about the details of observations of the cosmic microwave background. But do you have questions so far? All fine. Then I would come from the early to the late universe and speak about the growth of perturbations. Um, so far we have spoken about the symmetric universe only, right? the homogeneous and isotropic universe. We have not spoken about fluctuations or structures in the universe. But of course you are prominent examples of structures in the universe. Right? So we should better understand um, how we could form, uh, how we could have formed in an otherwise homogeneous and isotropic universe. All right, so we need to speak about the growth of perturbations, and I will follow the, the usual path um, that is being proceeded there. Um, this is in detail not very satisfactory, but it tells you um, about the principles of, of structure formations very clearly. I'm saying it's in detail not very satisfactory because it does not allow to go into the study of nonlinear cosmic structure growth. That's a different business, but we will get to that. All right, so here is what we start out from. First of all, we use the equations of hydrodynamics to describe um, the cosmic matter. This could be baryonic matter, this could be all the rest, which we call dark matter. We treat these matter components as fluids. This is a dangerous assumption <coughs> because fluids are defined as particle systems with, mean free, uh, with a mean free path going to zero. In other words, being very small compared to all other scales. This may be true for baryons. This is certainly not true for dark matter particles. This is one of the reasons why, with these equations, it is essentially impossible to study nonlinear structure growth. But nonetheless, uh, as long as the density fluctuations and the velocity fluctuations are small, we can use this approach. All right, the first equation is just the continuity equation. Right? Rho is the density, V is the velocity of the cosmic matter, and they follow the, uh, the continuity equation, or otherwise uh, they obey mass conservation. They also obey momentum conservation, so they also um, are controlled by the Euler equation uh, for an ideal fluid. Again, V is the velocity, phi is the gravitational potential, P is the pressure. Remember, we had two types of pressure for the kind of matter in the universe. Right? 
One was zero. <laughs> this was non-relativistic matter. The other one was rho divided by c square. This was relativistic matter. This pressure here is the pressure caused by fluctuations in the matter density. So this is, in fact, the thermal pressure. Okay? Because you compare the pressure here not to rho times c square, but to rho times v square. Okay? So here you need to compare the pressure not to the rest energy density of the matter, but to the kinetic energy density. So this is why you have to imagine the thermal pressure of the matter here, if there is any. Right? Okay, then, of course, this equation, since we, since we are using the, the gravitational potential here, assumes Newtonian gravity. Right? Hmm. Is this good or bad? Well, uh, if we can use Newtonian gravity, this is the Poisson equation here. There are lots and lots of conceptual difficulties hidden there. First of all, why can we use Newtonian gravity? Well, because the size of the structures that, you want to that we want to describe in this way is very small compared to the curvature radius of the universe. So the local Newtonian assumption, even though we are in general relativity, is admissible. Okay. Then the next question is, um, why can we use Poisson's equation? Right? As I said in, on, on Monday, uh, the solutions of the Poisson equation are determined by the boundary conditions you set. Of course, a homogeneous and isotropic universe does not have a boundary. If you want to solve the Poisson equation for a constant, a spatially constant mean density, turns out the only consistent solution is for density zero. This is of course not what you want. So what one usually does is one employs the so-called clean swindle, right? One subtracts um, the mean density here from the density and pretends that this amounts to subtracting a mean potential here. Mm, this is conceptually co completely flawed. However, if you do the whole calculation in relativity, right, in general relativity, and then linearize the equations, you find that this is an appropriate way to do. Okay? So you know about all that. Let's ignore <laughs> these problems and pretend as if we could do this. Right? All right. Now, what do we do? Well, first of all, we introduce density fluctuations and velocity fluctuations relative to the mean density and relative to the mean velocity. The mean velocity, of course, is the Hubble flow. All right, then we introduce, um, we introduce co-moving coordinates x, which uh, are related to the physical coordinates by r equals a times x. And we split up the velocity is according to that. Right? The, we, we split off from the velocities the, the mean Hubble flow. <coughs> and we transform this set of equations to these coordinates. Right? Then they just look like this. Never mind. I just wanted to tell you what the recipe is. You can go through that or not if you want. Um, the end result is this. Right? If you then combine um, the continuity and the Euler equations <coughs> into one equation for the density fluctuations delta. Right? Remember, remember, the density fluctuations are now the uh, the relative well the, the relative density fluctuations, so called density contrast, is uh, the density fluctuations delta rho divided by the mean density, and we we introduce also uh, the co-moving peculiar velocities, delta V divided by A, and so on. Right? It's just a uh, convention to do so. At the end, you arrive at this equation here. So it's the second, uh, second order time derivative of the density fluctuations. Here is a first order time derivative, and there's something proportional to delta. What does this equation remind you of? Something double dot plus something dot plus wave, huh? wave, wave equation, oscillator equation, right? In fact, this is a damping term. 
right? So this drives the, the oscillations, this damps the oscillations. <coughs> this is the sound speed. The sound speed enters because we the, the medium is supposed to have a pressure. Since we had the gradient of the pressure here, the wave vector k, the inverse wavelength of the perturbation enters here. Suppose we can either ignore the pressure right, and set the sound speed to zero, or the wave number k is very small, in other words, the perturbations are very large. Right? Then we can ignore this term. Then what do we have? Well, if you also ignore the damping term for the moment, you just have delta dot is something positive times delta. In other words, now you have a harmonic oscillator which has a negative frequency squared. Right? So without damping, you would expect either exponential growth or exponential decay. However, since you have a damping term, uh, the exponential growth is being slowed down to algebraic growth. Okay, so the solution will then look like delta is some power of the scale factor. All right, that's very easy. In the, in the converse limit, right, suppose you have either a high uh, sound speed or a large wave number squared, in other words, a small perturbation, and you ignore this term, right, then you have a, a, har a harmonic oscillator equation with a, with a positive frequency squared, and of course you get oscillations, these are sound waves. So the um, small perturbations are undergoing, driven, uh, driven by gravity, uh, fluctuation, uh, uh, yeah, acoustic oscillations. Um, if there is a, a non-negligible pres uh, pressure in the gas, otherwise perturbations grow because of the damping term they grow linearly. Right, that's the whole the whole message of this equation. Right, so it, it splits between a regime that oscillates and a regime that grows, and we expect the growth um, to be algebraic rather than exponential. All right. We get two solutions, of course, even for the, um, for the case when the, when the frequency squared is negative. One is going to, to increase, the other one is going to decay. I'm ignoring the decaying solution just because it does not matter for um, the cosmic structure growth. Then, of course, since the equation was homogeneous, I know that I can write the solution in this way. Right? Some amplitude today times uh, what we call the growth factor. Right? This is because for a homogeneous equation, some factor times the solution remains a solution. So the amplitude of the density fluctuation is not controlled by a homogeneous equation. All right, so in other words, all that this equation can control is the ratio by which density fluctuations can grow. And the result is in fact very easy. Right? Um, in this plot you see this so-called growth factor d plus divided by the scale factor. <coughs> okay, and you see for a universe which has only matter but no cosmological constant and is spatially flat, so-called einstein de Sitter universe. The ratio of growth factor divided by scale factor is 1. In other words, density fluctuations grow exactly in the same way as the universe itself grows. That's a very important fact, right? This means that, for example, density fluctuations, which began growing when the cosmic microwave background was released, can have grown by a factor of a thousand since and not much more, and that is very important. Um, if you change your cosmological parameters, for example, you insert low matter density and some cosmological constant um, to make the universe spatially flat, well, the behavior is somewhat different, but not very much. Right? So essentially, yeah, in, in a second, uh, essentially density fluctuations grow in about the, sa by by about the, the same amount as the, the universe grows itself. Yeah. Very much, very much. It would change very much. Then uh, these curves would fall, in fact, um, because while radiation dominates, matter fluctuations essentially do not grow. That's also a very important thing, but we will get to this later. All right, that's what we expect. Right? So this means at least very large 
uh, density fluctuations are expected to grow in the by the same proportion as the universe grows. And this is not too much. This is not too much. So in other words, the 14 billion years since the cosmic microwave background was released allow you a growth in the amplitude of cosmic f density fluctuations by a factor of a thousand. This is not a lot. All right, then the problem is the following. This is a map of the cosmic, uh, of the of the temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. Now suppose these temperature fluctuations reflect density fluctuations. We've seen that the density of the radiation is proportional to the temperature of the fourth power. In other words, uh, density fluctuations measured by these temperature fluctuations should be about four times the relative temperature fluctuations. Right? So delta rho over rho should be approximately four times delta T over T. And of course, rho goes like temperature to the fourth power. In other words, from these temperature fluctuations, we can read off the order of magnitude of the density fluctuations at that time. It turns out to be 10 to the minus 5. And now you multiply this by a factor of 1,000, you arrive at 10 to the minus 2. So would expect tempor uh, you would expect density fluctuations today um, on the order of a percent. But these density fluctuations that we see nowadays are on the order of a factor of 100. In other words, these simple considerations about linear growth of, of cosmic uh, density fluctuations uh, tell us that something is either grossly wrong, right, uh, or we must introduce something else, right, uh, because fluctuations can grow by a factor of a thousand since the initial state, and this will never ever bring us to the final state, which are both observed. Okay, yeah. This is gravity only, in, in fact, yes. How do you know that electromagnetism is negligible? From two reasons. So the, the, the question was, how do I know that electromagnetism is, is not important? Uh, first of all, the electric uh, Coulomb interactions would be shielded by uh, the, the, the uh, opposite charges, which makes the um, effective uh, electrostatic potential of Yukawa form rather than, than Coulomb form. So this thereby shielding introduces a finite uh, length scale over which the electrostatic um, forces can act, and this is very short compared to cosmological uh, length scales. So the only, the only force from electromagnetism that we could have is the magnetic force, and then we can estimate from, for example, Faraday rotation measurements, how large the magnetic field in large scale um, cosmic magnetic fields are. This turns out to be on the order of a nanogauss to about a tenth of a microgauss. In other words, the density fluctuations in the cosmic magnetic field are way too low to play any significant role. But it's something we have to assure, uh, assure us of, and it's completely correct. Yeah. All right, so in other words, with gravity alone, there is no way, no way to arrive from the beginning to the end unless there is something else that enhances gravity without leaving a trace in the cosmic microwave background. And so we would need a component of matter that does not interact with light because otherwise it would leave an imprint on the cosmic microwave background. And this is the strongest argument I know of for the existence of not electromagnetically interacting dark matter. Right. Of course, there are the arguments with galaxy clusters and, 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 and galaxy rotation curves and whatnot, right. but this simple argument tells you that there is no way with ordinary gravity without dark matter. And now, of course, you think about, uh, you, you, you can think about um, maybe ordinary gravity is wrong. Of course, right, all these possibilities are, are, are available. But within our concept of gravity, right, it's not possible to arrive from the beginning to the end. Okay, so this is the strongest argument for dark matter. Now, of course, the question is um, how much of it do we need? We know how many baryons we have, right? 4% of the um, of the critical density. Now the, the next question is how much dark matter would we need uh, in order to um, in order to get from here to there and in order to explain a lot of other uh, cosmological observations. So um, now I 
how much mass can you hide in stars? How much light would a star produce? Well, of course, for the Sun, the answer is easy. For producing one solar luminosity, you need exactly one solar mass. <laughs> how is this if you average over stellar populations? Uh, since they are dominated by low mass stars, you find that you need approximately six solar masses to produce one solar luminosity on average, right? Averaged over stellar populations. If you turn this round, you can say, all right, um, if I can measure the light emitted by a stellar population of a galaxy, for example, I can conclude that I need approximately six times that mass. But of course, this would be ordinary baryonic mass, right? Okay. Then, if at the same time, you measure the velocities of stars in galaxies, you have two mass measurements available. Right? One is the mass that you need in order to keep those stars gravitationally bound despite their motion. That's the kinematic mass. Right? And the other mass is uh, the mass that you need in order to explain the light that you see. And you find there's typically a factor of 10 difference. In other words, the, the stars move by a factor of, uh, of, of 10 faster, usually, than uh, what could be gravitationally bound by the mass that you see, even if you take this factor of 6 into account. Right? In other words, the motion of the stars in the galaxies tells us there's much more mass in the galaxies than we see. Okay, now, the galaxy population as a whole, contributes a density, uh, contributes to the cosmic density budget uh, approximately 8%. Right, so that is more than you would expect from the stars alone, but not too much more. Right? If you do, however, the same kind of estimate with galaxy clusters, right, which are the next largest objects on the cosmic hierarchy, so to speak, then you find that those objects, um, well, it's, it's not true to say that they, that they contribute 30% um, of the mass, but in the galaxy clusters, the ratio between ordinary mass and dark mass is such that if you extrapolate this to the whole universe, you end up with about 30% of the critical density. Then there's an interesting argument which says if the cosmic matter density was higher than that, then the whole galaxy cluster population would evolve very rapidly. There are tricky arguments leading to that, but nonetheless. So from the fact that we see galaxy clusters at high redshift, redshift of 1, 1 1.5, for example, which is high redshift for galaxy clusters, we can inverse, we, we can indirectly conclude that the density does in fact have to be low. Otherwise, there would be no galaxy clusters at redshift 1 or redshift 1.5. <laughs> all right. So, if this is all correct, right, if, that, if, if we can believe that the whole matter budget in the universe says that we need approxi approximately 30% of the, of the critical density in mass then we know what fraction of the mass needs to be dark, because we know from primordial nucleosynthesis that ordinary baryons can contribute only about 4%. And so we know that approximately 26% um, of the matter need to be dark. And as you know, we have no idea what that is. Mm. All right, but you see how direct these arguments are. Uh, I, I don't know how to evade this unless you want to fiddle with the gravitation law. All right, just for you to have a, have a visual impression, there's a galaxy cluster. It's a, gal it's a so called coma galaxy cluster. It's, it's called coma because it is in the, in the constellation of coma. Um, what you see is galaxies. So you see that a galaxy cluster is a cluster of galaxies. So, as is quite unusual in astronomy, this is aptly named. Uh, then you see by the, by the red diffuse signal that 
there is gas in the galaxy clusters which emits X-ray radiation. It's very soft X-rays and about um, yeah, on the order of, of 8 to 10 kilo electron volts. Right? But of course also from the X-ray emission you can, you can ask, the temperature gives you a kinetic energy for the electrons emitting this X-ray radiation. And by the virial theorem you can convert this to a potential depth. And by the size of the galaxy cluster you can convert this to a mass. And again, this corresponds to the mass that you get if you analyze the, uh, the motion of the galaxies. Right? So in, in internally, this, this picture is quite consistent. If, on the other hand, you measure the orbital velocities of the galaxies, sorry, of, of the stars and galaxies, and you plot the orbital velocity as a function of radius, you find that this curve is flat in most cases, um, which means that the mass or the, the mass density has to drop like r to the minus 2. But the light drops much faster. The light in such galaxies drops like uh, an exponential function. So these are all indications for the same thing, right? But the strongest argument, in my view, is still the argument that tells you without dark matter, there's no way from the temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background to density fluctuations that we see today. All right, before we speak about velocity perturbations, how about a brief break? Three minutes or so for you to get up, move around, be awake, <laughs> and sit down again. Oh, this is relatively sure because we do not see any segregation between the dark matter and the luminous matter. Otherwise, we would see that. Right? Otherwise, the, the gravitational clustering of, of luminous matter would be different from the gravitational clustering of dark matter. And there is no indication that this is in fact the case. And we see this, for example, through gravitational lensing experiments, which are sensitive to all matter. Right? So there is no, no substantial segregation between, between the, the two. There are some error bars. There are error bars, of course, of course, yeah. But if you ask, uh, suppose I allow for a different coupling with ordinary of gravity with ordinary matter or dark matter, what constraints can I put? There is no indication of anything else than a ratio of one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's too. Bad. Is it? <laughs> it would be interesting. <laughs> it would be interesting indeed. Yes. Well, this is pretty secure because we know rather well what the mass distribution or the light distribution of stellar populations are. Well, you do this. You do the estimate locally. Right, so of course there will be evolution effects if you, if you go out in, um, in uh, go back in time. But locally, I think this number is rather secure, right, because you can you can observe rather well between the infrared and the ultraviolet what stellar populations you have. Right. Yes, that's right. That's right, and. Strictly speaking, we don't know, right? We just extrapolate this from the Milky Way, right? So we are assuming that there's some universal universality in 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 um, stellar evolution. Yeah, yeah. You also were about to ask a question. Uh, <laughs> what is the, the average temperature of the dark matter? The uh, as far as we know, it doesn't have one, right? Because the velocity dispersion of the dark matter particles is immeasurably small. And it doesn't make sense to speak of a real thermodynamic temperature because the interaction between the particles is essentially zero. 
And so you would you would replace the temp uh, the, the the temperature by a velocity dispersion, and that seems to be very low. Uh, as far as we know, there is no uh, lower limit of the kinetic energy, no finite lower limit of the kinetic energy of the dark matter particles that we know of. At least we couldn't measure it so far. <coughs> All right, time to move on. <laughs> Refreshed. <laughs> uh, I'm sacrificing cosmic velocity fields to your coffee. See? And they are gone. <laughs> All right, let us now briefly speak about how we can quantify um, cosmic structures and therefore we will have a brief chapter in these lectures on statistics and the nonlinear evolution of um, the cosmic density fields and cosmic structures. So first of all we have to speak about power spectra and this will be one of the, one of the, central, um, one of the central concepts in, uh, in the following. Then we have to speak about how power spectra are evolving linearly and non-linearly. Then I will briefly speak about the so-called Seldovich approximation, which, which, which looks like a cheap trick but is, is amazingly successful. Um, and finally, I will say a few words about the non-linear evolution of, of cosmic structures. All right, so we had the density contrast delta. The idea is now that you order fluctuations in the cosmic density field by size. In other words, you do a Fourier transform. Then you get the delta with a hat as a function of wave number. And then you calculate the variance of the density fluctuations in Fourier space. In other words, the variance of the density fluctuations ordered by size. And this is the power spectrum. Okay? So there's a del uh, Dirac delta function here, um, which comes into the game only because of the statistical homogeneity of the density fluctuations that we have assumed. Right? So we uh, do not assume that density <coughs> field is homogeneous, of course not, right? because then we would not have any fluctuations. But we are assuming that the density field is statistically homogeneous, in other words, it has statistical properties that do not depend on the location. And of course, we have to assume this because otherwise we would, uh, we would violate uh, one of our central symmetry assumptions. And this is why this delta function appears. So in other words, the power spectrum is just the, um, the variance of the density fluctuations in Fourier space. No more, no less. Uh, then, uh, usually what we can observe is not the density fluctuation field, but the density fluctuation field averaged over some scale. This is because if you observe a galaxy out there, of course, the presence of this galaxy uh, randomly samples the underlying density field. But this also means that from the presence of a single galaxy, you cannot conclude anything about the underlying density field. You have to average over many galaxies before you arrive at an estimate for the density field from their number density fluctuations. This is why typically we observe <coughs> averages of the density fluctuations and the average is reflected by this kind of, of convolution of the density field with a window function which tells you that everything around an individual arbitrarily chosen point included by a sphere of radius r is being averaged over. Right? So these are these mean uh, density fluctuations delta bar here. If you now calculate the power spectrum again, you find, of course, that this convolution turns into a product uh, between the, the Fourier transform quantities. Of course, right? This is the, the, the Fourier convolution theorem. So in other words, um, then on any given scale r that you are averaging over, you can calculate an amplitude of the density fluctuation field, which is the integral over the power spectrum times the Fourier transformed window function that you have been averaging over squared. Okay, and this sigma parameter um, is used for normalizing the power spectrum. So very often in the cosmological liter literature you find a quantity that's called sigma 8. The 8 is purely historical. 
Right? This is because when people did this kind of measurement for the first time, they found that sigma was, approx sigma, yeah, was approximately one on a scale of eight megaparsecs. Right? Nowadays, sigma eight is between 0.8 and 0.9, uh, nonetheless. And so very often you find sigma eight, and what it means is just this is another way of, of normalizing, or this is one way of normalizing the power spectrum. It's another word of, of setting the amplitude of the power spectrum. Okay? So this is something we can measure. Not very well, interestingly. Right? So the sigma eight parameter, the amplitude of the power spectrum, um, is still one of the, of the least known cosmological parameters today. Right? There are interesting troubles with it. It's an interesting troublemaker, like many troublemakers are. All right. So this is an just a picture of the smoothing or averaging process I have been talking about. Right. So you start with a numerical simulation on top, right, just to illustrate this, and then with an increasing scale you average over it, and you can imagine looking at this that the more you average, of course, the lower is the amplitude. Right. It's not not a very not a very difficult point. <coughs> All right. However, now comes a very important point. Suppose we can measure the amplitude of the power spectrum in some way, or some friendly person does this for us. What can we expect for the shape of the power spectrum? And, and what I'm going to tell you now is essentially to say that under very simple assumptions, we expect a very simple shape of the power spectrum. Interestingly, this does exactly seem to be the power spectrum realized in nature. There's another of, of, of these moments in cosmology where you think, is this possible? Right? Can it really be that always the simplest thing seems to be realized? Um, maybe that's because we are simple-minded. That's also possible. All right. Um, the mechanism that I want to, to describe should have a picture here. The mechanism that I want to describe is the following. Suppose there's here's a small density perturbation, right? This one. Mm. As the universe evolves, the horizon is going to grow. I'm speaking about the horizons we were talking about on Monday, right? The horizon set the length scale for maximum causal connectivity. Right, so the horizon is going to grow over time. Why? Because, of course, as time proceeds, light can travel for a longer time, or over longer, longer length. All right. Now, suppose you, you study density fluctuations in co-moving coordinates, and the size of the perturbation always stays the same. Even in co-moving coordinates, however, the horizon is going to grow. So if you have a small density, well, let's stick with this, with this density perturbation for the moment. There will be a certain time when the horizon will be exactly the same size as the density fluctuation, and then it will grow beyond. Before that, the two ends of the density fluctuation will be out of causal contact. Afterwards, the complete density fluctuation will be in causal contact. So that marks a very important, uh, a very important transition um, in the evolution of the density fluctuation. All right. Now it turns out, if you do the, the corresponding calculation, that if a density fluctuation is so small that it enters the horizon, as we say, still during the radiation-dominated epoch, it essentially ceases growing until the radiation-dominated epoch is over. Why is that? This is because while radiation still dominates the expansion behavior of the universe, the gravitational collapse of ordinary matter against the radiation-driven expansion is very, s is very slow. So, of course, this way of speaking, right, a fluctuation enters the horizon is again misleading. It's not that the fluctuation enters the horizon, but that the horizon grows to encompass the fluctuation. Live with it, right? <laughs> fluctuation enters the horizon. All right. So, density fluctuations which are small enough to enter the horizon while radiation is dominant are essentially held up in their growth. 
Density fluctuations that are larger can still evolve, right? They can still grow outside the horizon because there is no causal connection between the ends of the density fluctuation and right, across the density fluctuation. So radiation pressure has no chance of holding up the, 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 the gravitational collapse. In other words, density fluctuations which are small enough are being slowed down in comparison to larger density fluctuations. Only such fluctuations which enter the horizon at matter radiation equality or later could grow all the time. So they grow essentially uninhibited. Everything else is inhibited. And it's inhibited all the more the smaller it is. Right? So again, the small fluctuations are the poor ones, but yeah. All right. So let's go back. Suppose the density fluctuation power spectrum uh, grows like some power of the wave number k before any of the modes, any of the density fluctuation modes enters the horizon. Then the small scale modes, those with a large k, will be suppressed relative to the large scale modes by a factor of k to the minus 4. This is something you can easily calculate from linear density fluctuation growth. I don't show it here, but uh, it's not a difficult calculation. <laughs> Essentially, you can read it off this kind of diagram here. All right. Now, of course, this will set in, or this kind of damping here, fluctuation damping, by this factor of, or suppression I should say, by this factor of k to the minus 4, will occur only for density fluctuation modes which are suppressed in the first place. In other words, such modes which enter the horizon uh, before matter radiation equality. So all the modes which are larger, in other words, all wave numbers which are smaller, then the wave number corresponding to the horizon size at matter radiation equality will grow without any suppression and all those which are larger will be suppressed. All right. The only question that remains is what is n? You can make simple arguments for that, but for example from the theory of cosmological e uh, inflation which we will have to go into, uh, we can expect that n is approximately 1 and a little bit smaller than 1. There are many other arguments that lead to the same result. So in other words, the simplest expectation for the shape of the power spectrum is that it starts like wave number k for small k or large wave numbers which never entered the horizon before matter radiation equality, reaches a maximum at k eq and falls off with k to the minus 3 asymptotically for the largest wave numbers. It's a very simple expectation. All right, that's what it looks like. Ignore the red curve for the moment. Uh, uh, I, I realize you can't. <laughs> the blue curve is underlying the red curve, right? But look at the blue curve. This is the expected shape of what we call the cold dark matter power spectrum. Dark matter, of course, is evident. Uh, cold means that the kinetic energy of the particles is supposed to be very small compared to the rest mass energy of the particles. Otherwise, otherwise, diffusion of the particles, right? diffusive motion of the particles would cut off this power spectrum somewhere. Right? By diffusion damping. Right? So, a power spectrum that grows like K for small k, falls off like k to the minus 3 asymptotically for large k, reaches a maximum at the wavelength, sorry, at the wave number of the horizon scale at matter radiation equality. Uh, this is the simplest expectation we, we can make. Yeah. No, but we would expect to see a lot of structure in the objects. We see galaxies, for example, which are our test particles, and they will cluster. 
and then we, then we can measure the power spectrum of this clustering and we expect that power spectrum to have a peak at KEQ. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> so now, this plot is somewhat misleading, but it's still so nice that I had to show it. Um, what is misleading is that, first of all, I do not show the power spectrum as before, but K cubed times the power spectrum. Right, so imagine you take the blue curve here and you multiply it with K cubed, then of course this would turn flat, because the asymptotic slope is expected to be K to the minus 3, would turn flat uh, for the largest wave numbers. And it would start growing like K to the fourth power for the smallest wave numbers. Okay? And now imagine you turn this round, right? you turn the horizontal axis round. So you have the smallest object here and the largest object there. And then you arrive at the plot that you see in the next slide. So light blue is the cold dark matter expectation. All the points are measurements. And to me this is a completely mind-boggling uh, plot. Right? It shows that again the very simplest expectation for the shape of the power spectrum seems to be realized in nature. Right? These are measurements from the largest scales, right? cosmic microwave background. Then you have measurements from all kinds of objects in the middle. Right? The galaxy cluster abundance, the uh, gravitational lensing effect, we will get to this. Um, galaxy clustering, this is what I, what I just said in response to your question. Right? You, you observe the, the scales and the typical patterns of the galaxies. Right? Um, then you measure the correlations of absorption lines in interstellar hydrogen clouds and so on and so on. Right? What happens is that this power spectrum starting like k, falling off like k to the minus 3, reaching a maximum, um, seems just seems to be what is realized. Right? And we have no evidence yet for any cutoff in the power spectrum. Right? As I said, if, cold dark if, if, if dark matter was not cold, but warm, let's say, or even hot, right, then the power spectrum would cut off somewhere. And this would mean that this power spectrum would turn to zero. And it would fall off exponentially, and of course this means that it would still fall off exponentially even, <coughs> even if you multiply this by a factor of k cubed. There is no evidence for a cutoff like that. So again, the simplest thing seems to be realized. And observations like that, or the collection of observations like that, um, shows you that, or uh, perhaps gives you an impression why we believe that since we have to accept dark matter, the most plausible assumption is that this dark matter is cold. In other words, consists of particles, maybe, right, um, whose rest mass energy is very much larger than its kinetic energy. And in that sense, they are supposed to be cold. What it all means, I don't know. It is an extremely interesting and important fact. All right, uh, let's get back to this. Um, of course, if you can measure the peak location of the power spectrum, you know what the horizon scale at matter radiation equality is. But since that scale is set by the density parameters of radiation and matter, and you know the density parameter of the of radiation because you can just measure the energy density in the cosmic microwave background. You can directly infer from the peak location of the power spectrum what the uh, matter density in the universe is. Yet another way of measuring the, the, the mass density. Turns out it's 0.3. Mm. So the internal consistency of the whole thing uh, is, is something, something very surprising. All right, the red curve shows you the nonlinear growth of the power spectrum. Let's jump over this for the moment. Uh, the main message for now is cold dark matter, it seems to be, and the shape of the power spectrum is set by very simple fundamental considerations. Right? Nothing, nothing very difficult behind this. The exact form of the spectrum, of course, this you have to calculate with the Boltzmann solver. But the general properties of the power spectrum, they are set by, by very simple physics. All right, how do you measure the power spectrum? Ah, this is a very difficult thing to do. Right? It's difficult because, um, of course, you have to 
Mm. You have to not only know where the galaxies are in the sky, but you need to know their distances as well. Then you can't directly measure distances, you have to infer them from the Hubble flow. Um, but you can't measure the Hubble velocity because you always measure the sum of the Hubble velocity and the peculiar velocity. But then you only measure one component of this sum of velocities, right? namely the component projected on your line of sight, and so on and so on and so on. And there are lots of problems in detail. Nonetheless, suppose we can do this, then what we can measure is a correlation function. What is a correlation function? Uh, this tells you by how much more probable it is to find a galaxy here if you know another galaxy is here, compared to the Poisson probability. Right? Poisson would just tell you, okay, the probability of finding a galaxy here and a galaxy there is proportional to density, s density of, of galaxy squared. If it's correlated, it's density of galaxy squared times 1 plus the correlation function. Right? It's the enhancement of probability of finding neighboring galaxies. All right, this fortunately turns out to be just the Fourier transform of the power spectrum. Right? So the idea is, all right, you calculate the num you, you count the number of pairs in galaxy surveys. You compare this to the Poisson expectation. This is essentially what is written down here. You then get 1 plus the correlation function. You subtract 1, you do a Fourier transform. Yeah, well, <laughs> if it was so easy. The principle is, suppose you can do this, then this is approximately the best thing we now have. Right? This is the, the result of current measurements of the galaxy power spectrum. Right? The power spectrum in the pattern of galaxies. And then, of course, you have to assume that these galaxies sample the underlying density field, which uh, is, is another business that I don't want to go into. Uh, nonetheless, of course, if you go from small to large scales, if you exceed the size of your galaxy survey, right, which is easily achieved, then of course you don't have any signal anymore. Right, the largest, the largest density modes you can sample are, of course, those enclosed by your surveys, and that not not much further than that. So this is why simply by this by the restricted size of the galaxy survey the error bars blow up here so there's not much we can do about this however you see the onset of a turnover right so this means that the largest galaxy surveys we now have are approaching the peak scale in the power spectrum and then from fitting a power spectrum to that you can already estimate where the where the maximum would be, right? Mm, with some inaccuracy. All right, gives you a density parameter in the dark matter of 0.233. All right. In addition, if you look closely, you see some fluctuations here. These are the, ref the reflections of acoustic oscillations in the baryonic matter imprinted on density fluctuations in the dark matter, right, the so-called baryonic acoustic oscillations. They are important because by the scale of their wavelength, right, the physical scale of their wavelength, you can measure the sound speed right, in the early universe. But that's another, another important thing, another matter, it's probably for, for tomorrow. All right, uh, let us briefly talk about the Seldovich <coughs> approximation, not because I, I wanted to make a big point out of that, but because it, here in this context, right, it's a very useful approximation, um, but it leads to a, a very surprising conclusion, um, which I, I wanted to tell you. So the Seldovich approximation says, the actual position of any matter parcel, right, galaxy for example, in the universe, is given by its initial position x times the scale factor plus an initial velocity times some functions. Right? Now what would inertial motion look like? Inertial motion would just say, I begin at a certain position, I multiply, I, I add the product of time times velocity, and I get the position later. Right? 
So essentially this means, the Seldovich approximation says, if you choose a convenient time coordinate, matter in the universe flows at least on large scales as if it would undergo only inertial motion. <coughs> this is the key of the Seldovich approximation. It's remarkably good on large scales. Right? All right. Now, what it allows you to do is, this is a map from the initial coordinates of the particles to their final coordinates. And the final coordinates are r, the initial coordinates are x. So I can compute a Jacobian matrix of this map. And the determinant of this Jacobian matrix, or rather the inverse determinant of this Jacobian matrix, will tell me how much matter is locally being compressed. In other words, from this so-called Seldovich deformation tensor, I can calculate um, an expectation value for the density evolution, and right, for the density. If I start with homogeneous density everywhere, and I multiply this homogeneous density, the mean density of the universe, by the inverse determinant of the Seldovich deformation tensor, I get an estimate for the local density. Right? It just tells you by how much matter is being compressed. Right? That's the, the content of the inverse determinant of this, of this tensor. Now, this is a symmetric 3 by 3 tensor. So you can diagonalize it. In other words, you can introduce a local frame in which this tensor is diagonal. So it will have three eigendirections, will have three eigenvalues. A very important realization due to Doroshkevich in 1972, I think, was that the probability for these eigenvalues of the Seldovich deformation tensor has a pre-factor which looks like this. How do I know the probability? Well, the assumption is that we start with a Gaussian random field. Right? We assume that we start with a random density fluctuation field which has locally Gaussian density distributions. There are very good reasons for that, which we will speak about when we speak about inflation. Nonetheless, suppose you start with a Gaussian random field, that's the simplest assumption you can make. Then you can calculate the probability distribution for these Seldovich deformation tensor eigenvalues. And it has this factor. What does this factor tell you? It tells you that the probability is zero for any two of these eigenvalues to be equal. So this means spherical collapse is forbidden. Collapse has to be anisotropic in a Gaussian random field. So there will always be a largest of these, of these um, eigenvalues here. This will be, yeah, and the probability of finding any other of these eigenvalues to be equal to that is zero, right? So this will, there will, will always be one that is not larger or equal than the next, so in fact larger than the next. This will be the eigenvalue along whose eigendirection collapse will proceed first. Right, so any spherical density fluctuation that you might uh, start out from will be deformed to an ellipsoid. Right, and then this ellipsoid will, will be compressed along the next direction the next eigendirection. And only then, the cigar that you get this way will be compressed to form a collapsed object. So in other words, uh, what we know from that is that uh, cosmic structure formation needs to proceed by first collapsing matter fluctuations to sheets, right? flat things, two-dimensional things essentially. And then those will, will be collapsed to one-dimensional filaments. And only then collapsed objects will form. For me, this is the, mo the most important conclusion from this very simple approximation, which otherwise turns out to be very powerful. Um, it tells you that an isotropic collapse has to happen. Isotropic collapse is forbidden. And this is the main reason why cosmic, density uh, uh, yeah, cosmic structures look like this, right? look filamentary. Can't you have a net local uh, 
angular momentum on these clusters? Of yes, you can. Yes, you can. And we see that. Right? If, you, if you calculate what the angular momentum of cosmic objects is, induced by the local gravitational tidal field, and you calculate how spiral galaxies should rotate, you find that they do, in fact, exactly in the same distribution as, as, you, would expect it, as, as you would expect them to do. All right, so that's the main reason, right? You expect from a Gaussian random field that it will lead by gravitational collapse to a filamentary matter distribution. Right? That's, that's one of the, the most straightforward conclusions uh, from gravitational collapse in a Gaussian random field. Even though gravity is, of course, isotropic, it leads to an anisotropic structure growth. It's very important. All right, and then you see these structures forming. These are the <coughs> results of cosmological simulations, of course. Ending at redshift zero, th this would be the present state. This is redshift one, this is redshift three. For a universe, which in both cases contains cold dark matter, in this case with a cosmological constant, in this case without, in both cases with low matter density, right, corresponding to the measurements, 0.3. And you see, all right, uh, the open model Well, both of them form these kinds of filaments. But the void regions, right, the empty regions surrounded by these filaments seem to be more empty in the open model than in the lambda CDM model. So there are fine differences which you can use in order to distinguish between the models. But nowadays, nobody doubts that, in fact, the cosmological constant is appreciable and makes up for the rest of the, um, of the energy content of the universe that remains between the point three of the critical density that we know is in matter to the critical density that we know n we need for spatial flatness. Now why we need spatial flatness is a different story. Let me briefly talk about nonlinear evolution. Um, first of all, nonlinear means that the density contrast grows above one. Uh, you see this in the power spectrum by this deformation here, right? So, as, as we have seen before, as long as density fluctuations remain linear, they just grow with a growth factor. Uh, since the, um, the power spectrum is a variance, it grows like the square of the growth factor, right? So the power spectrum would initially just start growing uh, like d plus squared or approximately with the square of the scale factor. All right, but then the nonlinear deformation sets in and it lifts off the small scale part of the power spectrum. Right, so this means that on small scales, um, the growth of density fluctuations becomes much faster um, than you would expect them to grow linearly. At the same time, you see that the red curve here falls somewhat below the blue curve, and right? it's not very clear because of the logarithmic scale here. But this means that power is being removed from intermediate scales and transported to small scales. Right? So in other words, power is being redistributed from, from intermediate scale or moderate scales to small scales. What else would you, ex would you expect gravity to do than attract matter? Right? So this is completely expected behavior. So for a long time, numerical simulations have been the only way to calculate this. Um, since a few, you know, since about a year, there is an analytic way to understand this, but uh, I will not go into detail with that. All right. So usually numerical simulations have been used in order to, to calculate the nonlinear growth of the of density fluctuations because we didn't know what to do else. Um, the nonlinear evolution causes mode coupling. This is what I just spoke about in other words. Right? Um, the nonlinear evolution not only makes the density fluctuation amplitude grow, but also makes fluctuations shrink. So what used to be a, small, uh, a large mode will become a smaller mode. So this means part of the amplitude that used to be on larger scales will end up on smaller scales. 
In other words, modes will be coupled in this way. This is what we, uh, what we mean with that. All right. If we believe that the density fluctuations began with a Gaussian random field, <coughs> then of course we know that it cannot remain a Gaussian random field. Right, because the density, um, density contrast, the delta variable, cannot fall below minus one. It's bounded from below. In other words, <coughs> the empty regions in the universe cannot grow emptier than empty. So there's a lower bound in density contrast, but there's no upper bound. In other words, the distribution of density fluctuation values must become skewed over time and cannot be Gaussian any longer. All right. Um, and we spoke about this, right? The typical behavior seen in numerical simulations um, is the formation of what Seldovich himself called pancakes, right? This is the flattening of, stru of cosmic structures, and then filaments, and then uh, compact objects. All right. And if you want to have a detailed picture, um, for now there is no other way than to run numerical simulations. And this is what they look like. If you compare the uh, the structure that you then observe, observe, right, measure, in the numerical simulations, uh, resembles the structure that is being measured very well by now. Right? All right, I think that's enough for today. Tomorrow, then, we will continue with the structures in the cosmic microwave background, right, to understand them a little bit better. Thank you very much. most important question, what is for lunch? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we still don't know whether this is due to the dark matter properties or due to the onset of what we call baryonic physics then. Right, because the cores of galaxies, for example, uh, are not only dominated by the dark matter, but also by the ordinary matter, which has pressure. <coughs> and the pressure leads to a different behavior than you would expect from purely dark matter. And we do not know yet, very convincingly, whether it is that kind of baryonic physics which gives rise to the discrepancies between the pure dark matter expectation and the observations on small scales. There are some people who say, no way, other people who say, of course. <laughs>
And so it seems that the only difference that you get between modified gravity models and ordinary gravity models is on such scales where you have a degeneracy between gravity and baryonic physics. This is very unfortunate, but so far that's the status of the of the of the of that research that I know of. I think you yeah, y that, that, that's true. Within a certain narrow range of parameters, right? <laughs> uh, you could explain baryonic effects also by modifications of gravity. That's true. And then, of course, it depends on, <laughs> on taste, essentially, <laughs> whether you would attribute effects to baryons or to, to gravity. Yeah. Uh, about that graph, um, so like you like you 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 like you like that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the green points at the left end seem to be I don't know. Significantly below the blue line? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, we don't take this very seriously, and I don't know whether we do, whether we do not take this seriously uh, rightly, you know. <laughs> uh, but the problem is that you have to derive these points, and they are already on rather small scales, um, from the observations of high redshift hydrogen clouds. And of those, you don't know very well how well they sample the underlying dark matter density field. Right, so what you see is fluctuations in a gas density. And how this gas density relates to fluctuations in the dark matter density, we don't know. And numerical simulations then give you an indication of how you should correct for them. And then you arrive roughly at the power spectrum. You, you, you no, not, not roughly. You do arrive at the power spectrum that you expect. Is that the no, no, this is not the cusp core problem because it does not occur in the centers of collapsed galaxies, but in, in, in dilute hydrogen clouds. Mm. So there's this problem behind, but then, as always, there's an excuse. Mm. <laughs> At least, this is the reason why we don't take this deviation seriously. Mm.